of Mark chapter 9. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go into hell, to the unquenchable fire. You may notice there's a note there in your Bibles, and if you check, check it, look a little more closely, you'll see that we're going straight from verse 43 to verse 45, at least in the ESV. And the same is true uh, after 45, we go straight to verse 47. Um, several um, uh, manuscripts um, include in those two places a repetition of verse 48, where Jesus says, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, so that that expression is actually there in some manuscripts three times, um, which really kind of gives some emphasis to some pretty hard words, doesn't it? Uh, we're going to read as it's written here for us, though. We'll pick up in verse 45. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. And you can be seated. <clears throat> Tough passage. Pray for me as I try to unpack it for you that what I say will be honoring to God and reflect what Jesus intends for us to understand. You'll, if you're looking still at the text there, you'll notice that there is a heading break between uh, verses 41 and 42. And we looked at uh, uh, the section uh, verses uh, 38 through 41 last week. Um, and... Uh, uh, but at the same time, you'll also notice if you have, especially if you have a red letter Bible, that there isn't any break in what Jesus says, and Mark doesn't give us any indication that what he's saying here is on a different occasion or addressing a different issue than what he's already been talking about. In fact, if you look um, at the end of this passage, at the end of verse 50, Jesus says, so be at peace with one another. And that really takes us all the way back to verse 33, which I think is the best way to understand this passage, the broader context, because it's in verse 33 and what follows after that that we learn that the disciples have been arguing with each other about who's the greatest. And then immediately after Jesus has to deal with that, John pipes up and says, and by the way, we told someone who was casting out demons in your name that he has to stop because he's not one of us. And so Jesus has to deal with that too. So there are these two conflicts. And we might actually look at those conflicts and say, yeah, so. It's the kind of stuff that happens all the time. People bicker. People judge each other and are, and are prejudiced against each other. What's, what, those don't seem like the biggest problems that we could imagine. They're the kinds of things, you know, that I often say, and I think it's probably true. We're most severe when it comes to the things that we would never do, Right? We give people we, we 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 champion the sins that we know we we don't have a struggle with, but um, these are the kinds of things that we do have a struggle with. And the thing that I think is happening here in this part, as Jesus is, all of this is kind of, needs to be understood together, is that Jesus wants them to understand the seriousness of what might seem trivial to them. Or to us. And he um, 
explains it in two ways, and each of the things that he talks about kind of addresses one of the issues that has come before. They were arguing with each other and, and letting their pride get in the way, who's the greatest, and the other was they were judging this guy and trying to prevent him from um, doing and, and doing ministry in Jesus' name. So the first thing he says and he talks about is the impact of our influence on others in verse 42. He says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Pleasant thoughts, right? In other words, the negative impact that our words and actions and influence has on the lives of others has grave implications for ourselves. And I'd say Jesus is pretty clear about the seriousness of the consequences, wouldn't you? Uh, I can't imagine there there are not many uh, perhaps worse ways to die than to have a piece of concrete tied to me and maybe be thrown into the sea. So that part of the message is clear, but who are the little ones that he's talking about? We might be inclined to conclude that since Jesus had just used a child as an object lesson in verse 36, that he was talking about children, and certainly um, that is true. In fact, I can imagine that the whole conversation right up until this time um, was taking place as that kid was still standing there. (laughs) And Jesus perhaps had his hands on his shoulders and he was continuing to use him as an object lesson. But the thing about children is not, um, that, that Jesus wants them to understand is that their faith is simple and straightforward. In fact, we'll learn more about that in, in just a few verses. But their faith is also vulnerable. And it can be easily crushed. And so children, in a sense, little ones, stand for anyone whose faith is vulnerable. And perhaps Jesus is speaking to the fact that this guy had been casting out demons in his name, wasn't really connected, and perhaps did not yet know and had not yet come into the fullness of faith in Christ. And so his faith was vulnerable, and the disciples had quashed it. All kinds of people, not just children, are spiritually vulnerable in all kinds of ways. Perhaps there are even times in our lives when all of us are spiritually vulnerable. Perhaps that vulnerability is rooted in the fact that they don't yet know who God is. They don't yet know Christ and they're trying and struggling to understand what the gospel is all about. Perhaps they might not yet have a sense of who the true and living God is, and they don't understand or know what he is like. They have a picture of him that isn't accurate. Perhaps that picture is coming clear, but they're wrestling with the radical step that every sinner has to take to abandon self and put your trust in him. Have you wrestled with those kinds of things in your own life? I certainly have. I'm uh, getting to know a guy at the gym um, who is wrestling with those things. He's been hurt by Christians. And so he's having a hard time figuring out um, uh, I, to, to some degree, you know, it's a reason for him to keep a distance, but at the same time, um, he has good reason why he's not so sure he wants to trust another Christian. And believers can be spiritually vulnerable as well. They can be enticed away from the truth to follow a different gospel, and we see that around us. Christians who follow the gospel of legalism, 
or who follow the gospel of permissiveness, that God really doesn't care anything about anything. He just lets you do whatever you want to do. Or anything that obscures the true gospel. Remember what Paul said to the Galatians? He said, even if an angel from heaven were to come and declare a different gospel than the one that I have declared to you, let him be condemned. And so even believers can have their faith crushed by untruth and betrayal and abuse and exploitation. Some of you perhaps have experienced those things. The Greek word that um, that Jesus that that Mark records, Jesus probably didn't say these words in Greek, but Mark uses the Greek word scandalizo, which is where we get our word scandal. Whoever scandalizes one of these little ones. And the same word is actually used throughout the passage. Whatever causes us to sin, if your eye scandalizes you, pluck it out. Whatever is a snare or puts up a barrier in any way or causes you to stumble. The point is that God takes seriously anything that endangers your and my spiritual well-being. And when we fail to recognize that, perhaps living like bulls in a spiritual china shop, oblivious to or unconcerned about the real impact that our actions and our influence have on other people, when we are oblivious to the fact that our actions can hurt others and be a scandal to their faith, we are actually placing ourselves in grave danger. And Jesus wants the disciples, after this kind of stuff that they've been expressing, he wants them to understand that. And I think that's a warning the church needs to take seriously in every time, and including in our time. We've wrestled with the reports over the last number of years of numerous sexual abuse scandals in the church and different um, accounts of how um, power has been used for spiritual abuse and exploitation and how the gospel can be used to manipulate people. What's worse, often those are followed by an attempt to cover them up and to explain them away, all in the name of preserving the witness of the gospel when in fact it's being undermined. So in light of what Jesus says here, it's important that we ask ourselves What kind of picture are we portraying to the world about who God is and what he's like and what's important to him? What's the picture that people get? Those are serious matters to God. We're not free to serve ourselves in God's name. We're not free to serve our own agenda in God's name. We're not free to cancel out God's judgment regarding what is true and right in the interests of social acceptability. And that's why I'm preaching this passage today, even though it's, very, it's a very socially unacceptable passage. Nobody likes to hear about hell. We're not free to act however we want in our homes or our workplaces or our neighborhoods, assuming that the impact we have on others is not that significant. The fact is our words and our actions and our attitudes influence people either toward God or away from him. And Jesus couldn't be more clear about the fact that God holds us accountable 
for that influence. So that's the first warning. We can't be indifferent to the impact that our words and our actions and our influence has on others. Secondly, in verses 43 through 48, Jesus says that we also must take seriously the impact of sin on our own lives. And in that section there, he lists three radical measures that underscore the seriousness of it. If your hand scandalizes you or causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your foot scandalizes you or is a snare to you, cut it off. If your eye scandalizes you, pluck it out. Again, Jesus doesn't pull any punches. He wants us to understand that sin has such serious consequences that there is no measure too extreme to take against it. That list of extreme reactions should help us to recognize, as Jesus is wanting the disciples to understand, that our spiritual well-being is far more important than our physical well-being. Our spiritual lives are eternal. Our physical lives are temporal. And remember that Jesus is talking to the disciples here. He's not talking to unbelievers. This is a message for us as much as it is for unbelievers. And so how are we to understand what Jesus says here? It's tempting, I think, that because we're under God's grace and our eternal destiny is secure, it's tempting to think that our sin has no real lasting impact on us. And that attitude in turn can lead us to become casual and indifferent to the sin in our lives. In fact, I can remember I had some friends in college and that was kind of the mindset that they had was, hey, I've been saved, I'm going to heaven, there's nothing that anybody can do to change that, so I'm going to live it up and have a great time. Have you heard that mindset before? But this passage makes it abundantly clear that a flippant attitude toward the sin in our lives is exceedingly dangerous, and the consequences are dire. It's also important, though, to understand, because I know that there are some of you, and and I understand why, would be deeply unsettled by this and feel very insecure in your salvation. And that's not what Jesus is intending to do here. This isn't a passage about losing your salvation. And Jesus isn't, in this moment, contradicting the whole message of the gospel and setting up a system of salvation or damnation based on works, based on what you do. The gospel is clear that we are saved by grace through faith, and it's not what we do, but what Christ has already done that saves us. But the point Jesus is making is that our sin is deadly serious because it kills us spiritually. So how does it kill us? kills us because when we sin, we distance ourselves from God, who is our life. Think about what sin is. I say this frequently because I think it's something we need to reprogram our our minds to understand. At its core, sin is not the bad things that we do. Sin is the stance toward God that lies behind the things we do. Sin comes out of our self-will. It's what Paul calls the flesh 
that part of us that insists that we're the ones who are in charge and that we have the right to do whatever we want and that God really has no right of authority over us. Before we're redeemed, and think, think about that, before we come to faith in Christ, before the light of truth comes on in our minds, that mindset of self-will is so deeply ingrained in us that we're not even conscious of it. We simply live out of our flesh as a matter of course. And that's what Paul or Isaiah is referring to when he talks about they stumble in the darkness. There is a level of self-imposed ignorance where we're so used to just living for ourselves, we don't even realize that we're doing it or that there is a different way to live. But when we are redeemed and we receive the Holy Spirit, our inclination to sin is brought into the light. And so it moves from the unconscious, just default way of living into a conscious, man, now I have to struggle against this desire to live the way I want and learn to live in obedience. And the presence and the voice of the Spirit in our lives makes us aware of the fact that when we sin, we are essentially saying no to God. And no to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And no thank you to the help that the Holy Spirit offers us. So sin is not a trivial matter either for unbelievers or believers. Because by our sin, we erect barriers between ourselves and God. And in so doing, we erect barriers between ourselves and the life that he wants to give us. For those who never put their trust in Christ, the end of that road is eternal separation from God. And Jesus describes it there in verse 48 in terms of a worm that does not die and a fire that is not quenched. The thing about that I think that's important, and and there are lots of different views about what hell is and the nature of it. At its core, I think Scripture teaches that hell is something that we choose, not something God imposes. To live apart from life, to live eternally with no life, is essentially the core of what hell is. And I, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Rico Tice, but I listened to a sermon that he gave on this topic as I was preparing uh, for it. And I remember him actually giving the sermon at uh, uh, a conference that I was at um, several years ago. He said, um, God is not interested in sending anyone to hell. In fact, The cross is a roadblock that he has erected in his desire to prevent people from going to hell. And the only way to hell is to trample the cross, to push it aside and say, I don't want it. It's a serious thing, though. It's something that should cause anyone who has not wrestled with these things to take them seriously and to evaluate themselves. And for the redeemed, for those of us who have come to faith in Christ, sin also has serious consequences. Because every time we say no to the Holy Spirit, we put up roadblocks in our lives, like I said, that distance us from God and from the abundant life that only he can give us. And that brings us back to the misguided notion that because we're saved and have eternal life, sin is no big deal. And the thing of it is, I think that lies at the heart of that, the misunderstanding, is our focus is on eternal life. But God didn't save us just to give us eternal life. 
He saved us to give us abundant life. And what is eternal life without abundant life? It's like imagining the prison doors have been thrown open, but you're still living in the prison. And so in verse 49, Jesus talks about another kind of fire. Notice what he says. He says, everyone will be salted with fire. The fire that he's talking about there is a fire of purification or sanctification. And that fire has the opposite effect from the fire of judgment that he was talking about in verse 48. On the surface, if you think about it, the metaphors of salt and fire seem contradictory. Salt is a preservative. Its whole purpose is to preserve things, and fire destroys things. So how do those two go together? Well, by putting them together, Jesus gives us a picture of a fire that preserves by destroying Let me say that again. Jesus gives us a picture of a fire that preserves by destroying. It's not a fire that destroys us like the fire of judgment does. Rather, it's a fire that destroys what's killing us, which is the old man who must be put to death. And the old man has to be put to death if we're going to live in the abundant life that God gave us eternal life to enjoy. So what Jesus is talking about is the work of the Holy Spirit. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to destroy what is destroying us. Does that make sense? Think of the picture of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you know the story of the three men that Nebuchadnezzar cast into the fire. And so they were, they were thrown into the fire. But what did the fire do? It burned up the ropes that were binding them. And then they were free. And so... It, was the fire that, it is the fire also that sets us free by destroying what is standing between us and abundant life, the fire of sanctification. The fact is, though, that in ourselves, we are not able to overcome the grip that sin has on us. Paul said that well in Romans chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. He says, I have the desire to do what is right, but I don't have the ability to carry it out because what I want to do is not the good. What I do is not the good I want, but the evil that I don't want to do, that's what I keep on doing. And that's why he goes on to say in chapter 8, that we need the Holy Spirit because it's the Spirit who empowers us to be victorious in the battle against sin. We are victorious when we say no to the flesh, which desires to be its own master, and when we say yes to the Spirit who empowers us to obedience. Can you see how that works? And and I think it's important for us to understand there is no neutral territory. We are either moving toward God or away from him. The more we say yes to sin, the further it pushes us away from God and back to self. And the more we say yes to the spirit, the closer it draws us into dependence on him and fellowship with him. So, when you think about it, giving in to sin requires the very thing that steals our life. 
Because to give in to sin, you have to become increasingly indifferent toward God. And in the same way, the fight against sin requires the very thing that gives us life. Because it requires us to be be increasingly dependent on God for what we can't do for ourselves. So Paul says, I just want to read to you a couple verses from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 13. Paul says, so then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So as Paul says, let us walk by the Spirit. Well, it's a hard sermon to preach, perhaps a hard sermon to listen to. But it is the word of God. And we can't ignore it. We oughtn't to take it lightly. It's important that we take seriously everything that God says. And he says it because he loves us. His desire is to give us abundant life. And I think so often we we miss that. And we're content to live in prison. We're content to live in prisons where the doors have already been flung open. May that not be so of us. May we follow the Spirit into the fullness and the abundance of the life that God wants to give us forever. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just pray for these words from your word and the words that I have spoken. I pray for your spirit to take them and to use them in each one of our lives as you see fit. It is hard to face the fires of purification. It is hard to face what destroys. But Lord, your desire in destroying all of that brokenness and self-will in us is that you might give us the life that you made us for. And I pray that you will help us in the midst of the, the difficulties that that brings for us, the struggle that we feel and Um, the failure and the success and the resistance and all the different things that we go through as we fight this battle against sin. Help us to trust you in the process and to trust that what you're doing is good. Help us to take it seriously. And then, Lord, work in us by your Spirit what we cannot do ourselves. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Worship team. Grace and peace to you, brothers and sisters in Christ. May the Lord God, by his spirit, strengthen each one of us in our battle against that which would steal our life. And may we surrender to his good work of destroying what is destroying us, that we might live in the fullness of of the life that he has for us. God bless you as you go.